What's up everybody and welcome back to Dead Noise. I'm Chris and I have the esteemed pleasure of standing next to a horror movie legend from the original Night of the Living Dead, Mr. John Russo. Hello everybody and he calls me a living legend. I get called <laughs> that quite often. And I always tell people, hey, you know, I put my pants on one leg at a time like everybody else. <laughs> How's the convention been treating you so far? Well, we're just getting started. Yesterday was kind of slow, and I, just, I think somebody told me that only VIPs were allowed in on Friday, mm. which I've never encountered that before. But now we're, business is picking up this morning. It's, it's Saturday morning, and uh, we're doing pretty steady business. And we always have fun meeting people, shaking hands, talking, telling them, telling them uh, funny stories, and signing autographs. So that's what we're doing. This year is the 55th anniversary of the original Night of the Living Dead. What can you tell me about the experience being on set with Romero, being a zombie for a film that would become so legendary later down the line? Well, our ambition was to be, be uh, feature filmmakers, and it was my idea to make Night of the Living Dead the, almost the second that we had a 35 millimeter camera. We already had editing, mixing gear, and so on. We've worked our butts off getting all that stuff, sleeping on the studio floor, et cetera. And uh, also, I wrote most of the script. The idea of dead people after human flesh was my idea, not George's. I've been telling that lately, just so people understand what really happened. And I wrote most of the script, so. Hmm. But beyond that, we were all together. We were a tight-knit production group and solidly behind George as a director. And, George did a masterful job, which was quite obvious. George was a genius with a camera. He shot most of the film, 98% of it. Russ Streiner and I shot backup footage, but everybody did everything, whether I, I got set on fire with real gasoline, because <laughs> I thought we'd look stupid if we didn't was throwing all these Molotov cocktails and nobody got set on fire, so I volunteered, I just did it. Because we wanted to make the mu the best movie we could, and we had not too mu much money to do it with, but we had zeal and we had talent. Did you have a favorite scene in the film, um, whether it was from a production perspective, one that was really challenging, or just a scene in general that sticks out to you personally? Well, maybe one of the most challenging was me getting set on fire. We ended up getting <laughs> because we didn't know if I was going to die <laughs> you know but we had it planned out pretty carefully and uh and we ended up doing three takes and they all ended up in the movie three different angles and i had uh you know carl hardman uh formed a puddle of gasoline george and i set the camera up set the shot up because i was being the assistant cameraman as well as the head ghoul right then <laughs> and uh, so he made a puddle of gasoline around my feet and up my leg and back and on action, Carl would throw a match in into the puddle and zingo. I had to stagger like a ghoul until I felt my hair being singed. And then I would fall and roll over this hillside where people were waiting with furniture blankets to smother the flames. And Carl had this delightful, delighted look on his face because we and sometimes there was dissension between me and Carl a little bit. And I, I used to say that I didn't know. He would probably wouldn't have cared if I did go up in flames, but he was glad we were getting such a great shot for our uh, low-budget movie. Mm -hmm. And speaking of it being a low-budget film, it has stood the test of time and is still a gleaming example of independent cinema. And a lot of people see it as one of the trailblazers for the movement and just being able to do a lot with a little. So Well, the reason I see it that way is because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it did blaze trails for every kind, not just for the horror genre, but filmmaking in general, because it, it showed uh, people how they could get start their career if they could come up with a good idea and make a movie on a low budget, maybe raise some money from friends or however they had to do it, and launch their career. So. Uh, it was a trailblazer for horror and for, for the movie business in general. And I'm sure you've been asked this question a lot, but 55 years ago, did you guys know just how influential this film would be? We did not. We <laughs> knew damn sure. We had total confidence 
that we were making a good movie. Nobody doubted that, and like I said, we were solidly behind George Romero as a director, where oftentimes there's a lot of backstabbing and ego problems and this and that. No, everybody knew what to do. Everybody wore many hats and wore them well. And, but we thought, uh, even after the film was edited in our, our first screenings with friends, families, and investors, uh, people loved the movie. But we thought it would be like most movies of that time that uh, uh, played theatrically to some extent and then went into the drive-ins and neighborhood theaters and had a life of about two and a half to three years and, and then pretty much disappeared. That's what we thought would happen, <laughs> even though it was a good movie. Mm -hmm. Nobody could have predicted that, I don't think anyone could have predicted <laughs> that it would be the phenomenon that it became, although Rex Reed, who was one of the most prominent movie critics ever in New York City, the movie early on played a year and a half steady at midnight screenings at, in New York City and at the Waverly Theater, and he did write that anybody interested in horror or in cinema in general, if for anybody of that sort, it was unthinkable for them not to see Night of the Living Dead. So it was, you know, you could say that that was the that was prescient. That he, you know, that was maybe one of the first indications that this movie was a lot more than just a standard horror film. Hmm. And you've been instrumental in carrying on the legacy of the Living Dead franchise, property, whatever you want to call it. Well, Russ Strinder and I did all the work for 50 years, all the way through the lawsuits, <laughs> the legal battles, the this mm -hmm. and that and that. And his brother Gary came back from wherever he was, and he had a career in advertising, and uh, he kind of wanted to take over. Mm. And uh, now I, I'm not on the board anymore. I, I, I resigned, and, and uh, but they carry it forward. Now it's easier because it's got the Criterion Editions, the Museum of Modern Art remastered, mm. and the copyright on that edition, whereas when Russ and I were dealing we have a, a shaky copyright through no fault of our own. The distributor caused that, and, but it was a harder to make deals. We kept at it, but it was harder to make deals then. Not all of a sudden it got easier mm. recently because of, of Criterion and the Museum of Modern Art. And talking about the modern day now, you were still very active, still very busy. Just before we started rolling, we were talking about Crackoon and My Uncle John is a Zombie. Mm -hmm. Are there any more upcoming projects that you have that you want fans to take note of and keep an well, eye on? Well, I actually have, uh, I'm told by, by the uh, prospective director of uh, Spawn of the Living Dead, a script I wrote very, probably about 10 years ago, but I didn't uh, really put a lot of effort into promoting it, but she loved it and wants to direct it. Looks like Sony's going to finance it for about two and a half million. I also have just finishing now, just almost ready for distribution, as a, a Western uh, based on the true story of the Rufus Buck gang. And they were, uh, this is called The Night They Came Home. And the novel is already out and the movie is just about finished. And it looks like it's going to be great. I wrote it, but I did not direct it. Mm. it shot in California, cast is great, and uh, this gang went on a rampage of rape and murder for 19 days. When they were finally caught, they were all hanged at Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1895. Hanged it. All, this gallows could hang 12 people at once, and there were five of them, mm. and they were hanged all at the same time. So I have a fictional story based upon, based around their true exploits. Okay. And is there any closing message that you want any fans to hear from you? Any more stuff you have in the works or where they can find you online? Anything like that? Well, I'm, I'm about to open a Shopify store called The John Russo. My fan page on Facebook, my new fan page is, uh, is called The John Russo. I have a, an older fan page that's going to be phased out because it has a limit of, uh, you know, Facebook has a limit of 5,000 people and I have a hell of a lot more fans <laughs> than that. Yep. So it's all being moved over to the John Russo, which you can 
sign up now. Sign up, please, if you if you have in, interested in what I'm doing and interested in horror in general. And we have yeah, I'm in Cracoon. <laughs> I play a coroner. <laughs> and, uh, Cracoon. Trying to figure out why this girl is dead. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, we we'll just do a lot of things. I ha I have twelve, uh, ten new novels out over the past three years through Wolfpack Publishing and Gary's Lee Vincent's company, Burning Bulb Publishing, distributes some of my movies and publishes quite a few of my books. So hmm. they'll all be on the Shopify site and on burningbulbpublishing.com. So we keep busy. We don't <laughs> intend to quit. Good to know. I'll be on the lookout for sure. Right. And that Thank was you. everything I had for you. Thank you so much for Thanks your time. A lot. I had a blast talking with you. Okay. And until the next interview, stay tuned, stay scared, and I'll catch you later.